This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Economy. Part 4. As with our colleges, so with a hundred modern improvements. There is an illusion about them. There is not always a positive advance. The devil goes on exacting compound interest to the last for his early share and numerous succeeding investments in them. Our inventions are wont to be pretty toys which distract our attention from serious things. They are but improved means to an unimproved end, an end which it was already but too easy to arrive at, as railroads lead to Boston or New York. We are in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas, but Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. Either is in such a predicament as the man who was earnest to be introduced to a distinguished deaf woman, but when he was presented and one end of her ear trumpet was put into his hand, had nothing to say. As if the main object were to talk fast, and not to talk sensibly. We are eager to tunnel under the Atlantic and bring the old world some weeks nearer to the new but perchance the first news that will leak through into the broad, flapping American ear will be that the Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough. After all, the man whose horse trots a mile in a minute does not carry the most important messages. He is not an evangelist, nor does he come round eating locusts and wild honey. I doubt if flying childers ever carried a peck of corn to mill. One says to me, I wonder that you do not lay up a money. You love to travel. You might take the cars and go to Fitchburg today and see the country. But I am wiser than that. I have learned that the swiftest traveler is he that goes afoot. I say to my friend, suppose we try who will get there first. The distance is thirty miles, the fare ninety cents. That is almost a day's wages. I remember when wages were sixty cents a day for laborers on this very road. Well, I start now on foot, and get there before night. I have traveled at that rate by the week together. You will in the meanwhile have earned your fare and arrive there some time tomorrow, or possibly this evening if you are lucky enough to get a job in season. Instead of going to Fitchburg, you will be working here the greater part of the day. And so, if the railroad reached round the world, I think that I should keep ahead of you. And as for seeing the country and getting experience of that kind, I should have to cut your acquaintance altogether. Such is the universal law which no man can ever outwit. And with regard to the railroad, even we may say it is as broad as it is long. To make a railroad round the world available to all mankind is equivalent to grading the whole surface of the planet. Men have an indistinct notion that if they keep up this activity of joint stocks and spades long enough, all will at length ride somewhere, in next to no time and for nothing. But though a crowd rushes to the depot, and the conductor shouts, All aboard! When the smoke is blown away and the vapor condensed, it will be perceived that a few are riding, but the rest are run over, and it will be called, and will be, a melancholy accident. No doubt they can ride at last who shall have earned their fare, that is, if they survive so long but they will probably have lost their elasticity and desire to travel by that time. This spending of the best part of one's life earning money in order to enjoy a questionable liberty during the least valuable part of it, 
reminds me of the Englishman who went to India to make a fortune first, in order that he might return to England and live the life of a poet. He should have gone up Garrett at once. What? exclaim a million Irishmen, starting up from all the shanties in the land. Is not this railroad, which we have built, a good thing? Yes, I answer, comparatively good. That is, you might have done worse. But I wish, as you are brothers of mine, that you could have spent your time better than digging in this dirt. Before I finish my house, wishing to earn ten or twelve dollars by some honest and agreeable method, in order to meet my unusual expenses, I planted about two acres and a half of light and sandy soil near it, chiefly with beans, but also a small part with potatoes, corn, peas, and turnips. The whole lot contains eleven acres, mostly growing up to pines and hickories, and was sold the preceding season for eight dollars and eight cents an acre. One farmer said that it was, quote, good for nothing but to raise cheeping squirrels on, end quote. I put no manure whatever on this land, not being the owner but merely a squatter, and not expecting to cultivate so much again and I did not quite hoe it all at once. I got out several cords of stumps in ploughing, which supplied me with fuel for a long time, and left small circles of virgin mould, easily distinguishable, through the summer by the greater luxuriance of the beans there. The dead, and for the most part unmerchantable wood behind my house, and the driftwood from the pond, have supplied the remainder of my fuel. I was obliged to hire a team and a man for the ploughing, though I held the plough myself. My farm outgoes for the first season were, for implements, seed, work, etc., $14.72 plus. The seed corn was given me. This never costs anything to speak of, unless you plant more than enough. I got twelve bushels of beans and eighteen bushels of potatoes, besides some peas and sweet corn. The yellow corn and turnips were too late to come to anything. The whole income from the farm was $23.44, deducting the outgoes, $14.72 plus, there are left $8.71 plus. Beside produce consumed and on hand at the time, this estimate was made of the value of $4.50, the amount on hand much more than balancing a little grass which I did not raise. All things considered, that is, considering the importance of a man's soul and of today, notwithstanding the short time occupied by my experiment, nay, partly even because of its transient character, I believe that was doing better than any farmer in Concord did that year. The next year I did better still, for I spaded up all the land which I required, about a third of an acre, and I learned from the experience of both years, not being in the least awed by many celebrated works on husbandry, Arthur Young among the rest, that if one would live simply and eat only the crop which he raised, and raise no more than he ate, and not exchange it for an insufficient quantity of more luxurious and expensive things, he would need to cultivate only a few rods of ground, and that it would be cheaper to spade up that than to use oxen to plough it, and to select a fresh spot from time to time than to manure the old, and he could do all his necessary farm work, as it were with his left hand, at odd hours in the summer and thus he would not be tied to an ox, or horse, or cow, or pig, as at present. I desire to speak impartially on this point, and as one not interested in the success or failure of the present economical and social arrangements. I was more independent than any farmer in Concord, for I was not anchored to a house or farm, but could follow the bent of my genius, which is a very crooked one, every moment. 
beside being better off than they already, if my house had been burned or my crops had failed, I should have been nearly as well off as before. I am wont to think that men are not so much the keepers of herds as herds are the keepers of men. The former are so much the freer. Men and oxen exchange work. But if we consider necessary work only, the oxen will be seen to have greatly the advantage. Their farm is so much the larger. Man does some of his part of the exchange work in his six weeks of haying, and it is no boy's play. Certainly no nation that lived simply in all respects, that is, no nation of philosophers, would commit so great a blunder as to use the labor of animals. True, there never was and is not likely soon to be a nation of philosophers, nor am I certain it is desirable that there should be. However, I should never have broken a horse or bull and taken him to board for any work he might do for me, for fear I should become a horseman or herdsman merely. And if society seems to be the gainer by so doing, are we certain that what is one man's gain is not another's loss, and that the stable-boy has equal cause with his master to be satisfied? Granted that some public works would not have been constructed without this aid, and let man share the glory of such with the ox and horse. Does it follow that he could not have accomplished works yet more worthy of himself in that case? When men begin to do not merely unnecessary or artistic, but luxurious and idle work with their assistance, it is inevitable that a few do all the exchange work with the oxen, or, in other words, become the slaves of the strongest. Man thus not only works for the animal within him, but, for a symbol of this, he works for the animal without him. Though we have many substantial houses of brick or stone, the prosperity of the farmer is still measured by the degree to which the barn overshadows the house. This town is said to have the largest houses for oxen, cows, and horses hereabouts, and it is not behind hand in its public buildings. But there are very few halls for free worship, or free speech in this county. It should not be by their architecture, but why not even by their power of abstract thought? that nations should seek to commemorate themselves. How much more admirable the Bhagavad Gita than all the ruins of the East! Towers and temples are the luxury of princes. A simple and independent mind does not toil at the bidding of any prince. Genius is not a retainer to any emperor, nor is its material silver, or gold, or marble, except to a trifling extent. To what end, pray, is so much stone hammered? In Arcadia, when I was there, I did not see any hammering stone. Nations are possessed with an insane ambition to perpetuate the memory of themselves by the amount of hammered stone they leave. What if equal pains were taken to smooth and polish their manners. One piece of good sense would be more memorable than a monument as high as the moon. I love better to see stones in place. The grandeur of Thebes was a vulgar grandeur. More sensible is a rod of stone wall that bounds an honest man's field than a hundred gated Thebes that has wandered farther from the true end of life. The religion and civilization which are barbaric and heathenish build splendid temples, but what you might call Christianity does not. Most of the stone a nation hammers goes towards its tomb only. It buries itself alive. 
as for the pyramids. There is nothing to wonder at in them, so much as the fact that so many men could be found degraded enough to spend their lives constructing a tomb for some ambitious booby whom it would have been wiser and manlier to have drowned in the Nile and then given his body to the dogs. I might possibly invent some excuse for them and him, but I have no time for it. As for the religion and love of art of the builders, it is much the same all the world over, whether the building be an Egyptian temple or the United States Bank. It costs more than it comes to. The main spring is vanity, assisted by the love of garlic and bread and butter. Mr. Balcom, a promising young architect, designs it on the back of his Vitruvius with hard pencil and ruler, and the job is let out to Dobson and Sons, stone-cutters. When the thirty centuries begin to look down on it, mankind begin to look up at it. As for your high towers and monuments, there was a crazy fellow once in this town who undertook to dig through to China, and he got so far that, as he said, he heard the Chinese pots and kettles rattle. But I think that I shall not go out of my way to admire the hole which he made. Many are concerned about the monuments of the West and the East, to know who built them. For my part I should like to know who in those days did not build them, who were above such trifling. But to proceed with my statistics. By surveying, carpentry, and day-labor of various other kinds in the village in the meanwhile, for I have as many trades as fingers, I had earned thirteen dollars thirty-four cents. The expense of food for eight months, namely from July 4th to March 1st, the time when these estimates were made, though I lived there more than two years. Not counting potatoes a little green corn, and some peas which I had raised, nor considering the value of what was on hand at the last date, was rice, one dollar, seventy-three cents and a half. Molasses, one dollar, seventy-three cents. Cheapest form of the saccharin. Rye meal, one dollar, four cents, three quarters. Indian meal, Ninety-nine cents, three-quarters, cheaper than rye. Pork, twenty-two cents. All experiments which failed. Flour, eighty-eight cents. Costs more than Indian meal, both money and trouble. Sugar, eighty cents. Lard, sixty-five cents. Apples, twenty-five cents. Dried apple, twenty-two cents. Sweet potatoes, ten cents. One pumpkin, six cents. One watermelon, two cents. Salt, three cents. Yes, I did eat eight dollars seventy-four cents, all told. But I should not thus unblushingly publish my guilt if I did not know that most of my readers were equally guilty with myself, and that their deeds would look no better in print. The next year I sometimes caught a mess of fish for my dinner, and once I went so far as to slaughter a woodchuck which ravaged my bean-field, affect his transmigration, as a tartar would say, and devour him, partly for experiment's sake. But though it afforded me a momentary enjoyment, notwithstanding a musky flavor, I saw that the longest use would not make that a good practice however it might seem to have your woodchucks ready dressed by the village butcher. Clothing and some incidental expenses within the same dates, though little can be inferred from this item, amounted to eight dollars forty cents minus three quarters. Oil and some household utensils, two dollars. So that all the pecuniary outgoes, 
excepting for washing and mending, which for the most part were done out of the house, and their bills have not yet been received. And these are all, and more than all, the ways by which money necessarily goes out in this part of the world, were house, $28.12 plus, farm, one year, $14.72 plus, food, eight months, $8.74, clothing, etc., eight months, $8.40 minus three quarters, oil, etc., eight months, $2. In all, $61.99 minus three quarters. I address myself now to those of my readers who have a living to get, and to meet this I have, for farm produce, sold $23.44. Earned by day labor, $13.34. In all, $36.78. Which, subtracted from the sum of the outgoes, leaves a balance of $25.21, three quarters on the one side. This being very nearly the means with which I started, and the measure of expenses to be incurred. And on the other, beside the leisure and independence and health thus secured, a comfortable house for me as long as I chose to occupy it. These statistics, however accidental and therefore uninstructive they may appear, as they have a certain completeness, have a certain value also. Nothing was given me of which I have not rendered some account. It appears from the above estimate that my food alone cost me in money about twenty-seven cents a week. It was, for nearly two years after this, rye and Indian meal, without yeast, potatoes, rice, a very little salt pork, molasses, and salt, and my drink, water. It was fit that I should live on rice, mainly, who love so well the philosophy of India. To meet the objections of some inveterate cavillers, I may as well state that if I dined out occasionally, as I always had done, and I trust shall have opportunities to do again, it was frequently to the detriment of my domestic arrangements. But the dining out being, as I have stated, a constant element, does not in the least affect a comparative statement like this. I learned from my two years' experience that it would cost incredibly little trouble to obtain one's necessary food, even in this latitude, that a man may use as simple a diet as the animals, and yet retain health and strength. I have made a satisfactory dinner, satisfactory on several accounts, simply off a dish of purslane, portulaca oleracea, which I gathered in my cornfield, boiled and salted. I give the Latin on account of the savoriness of the trivial name. And pray, what more can a reasonable man desire in peaceful times, in ordinary noons, than a sufficient number of ears of green, sweet corn boiled with the addition of salt. Even the little variety which I used was a yielding to the demands of appetite, and not of health. Yet men have come to such a pass that they frequently starve, not for want of necessaries, but for want of luxuries. And I know a good woman who thinks that her son lost his life because he took to drinking water only. The reader will perceive that I am treating the subject rather from an economic than a dietetic point of view, and he will not venture to put my abstemiousness to the test unless he has a well-stocked larder. Bread I at first made of pure Indian meal and salt, and genuine hoe-cakes, which I baked before my fire out of doors on a shingle, or the end of a stick of timber sawed off in building my house. But it was wont to get smoked, and to have a piney flavor. I tried flour also, but have at last found a mixture of rye and Indian meal, most convenient and agreeable. In cold weather it was no little amusement to bake several small loaves of this in succession, 
tending and turning them as carefully as an Egyptian his hatching eggs. They were a real cereal fruit which I ripened, and they had to my senses a fragrance like that of other noble fruits, which I kept in as long as possible by wrapping them in cloths. I made a study of the ancient and indispensable art of bread-making, consulting such authorities as offered, going back to the primitive days and first invention of the unleavened kind, when from the wildness of nuts and meats men first reached the mildness and refinement of this diet. And traveling gradually down in my studies, through the accidental souring of the dough, which it is supposed taught the leavening process, and through the various fermentations thereafter, till I came to good, sweet, wholesome bread, the staff of life. Leaven, which some deem the soul of bread, the spiritus, which fills its cellular tissue, which is religiously preserved like the vestal fire, some precious bottleful, I suppose, first brought over in the Mayflower, did the business for America, and its influence is still rising, swelling, spreading in cerealian billows over the land. This seed I regularly and faithfully procured from the village, till at length, one morning, I forgot the rules, and scalded my yeast, by which accident I discovered that even this was not indispensable for my discoveries were not by the synthetic but analytic process. And I have gladly omitted it since, though most housewives earnestly assured me that safe and wholesome bread without yeast might not be, and elderly people prophesied a steady decay of the vital forces. Yet I find it not to be an essential ingredient, and after going without it for a year am still in the land of the living and I am glad to escape the trivialness of carrying a bottleful in my pocket, which would sometimes pop and discharge its contents to my discomfiture. It is simpler and more respectable to omit it. Man is an animal who, more than any other, can adapt himself to all climates and circumstances. Neither did I put any sal soda or other acid or alkali into my bread. It would seem that I made it according to the recipe which Marcus Porcius Cato gave about two centuries before Christ. Panem depsticium sic facito, manus mortariumque bene lavato, ferinam in mortarium indito, aque palatim adito, subigitoc pulcre, ubi bene subigeris, Defingito coquitoc sub testu, which I take to mean, quote, Make kneaded bread thus. Wash your hands and trough well. Put the meal into the trough, add water gradually, and knead it thoroughly. When you have kneaded it well, mold it and bake it under a cover. End quote that is, in a baking kettle. Not a word about leaven. But I did not always use this staff of life. At one time, owing to the emptiness of my purse, I saw none of it for more than a month. Every New Englander might easily raise all his own breadstuffs in this land of rye and Indian corn, and not depend on distant and fluctuating markets for them. Yet, so far are we from simplicity and independence that, in Concord, fresh and sweet meal is rarely sold in the shops, and hominy and corn in a still coarser form are hardly used by any. For the most part the farmer gives to his cattle and hogs the grain of his own producing, and buys flour, which is at least no more wholesome, at a greater cost, at the store. I saw that I could easily raise my bushel or two of rye and Indian corn, for the former will grow on the poorest land, and the latter does not require the best, and grind them in a hand-mill, and so do without rice and pork. 
and if I must have some concentrated sweet, I found by experiment that I could make a very good molasses either of pumpkins or beets, and I knew that I needed only to set out a few maples to obtain it more easily still, and while these were growing I could use various substitutes beside those which I have named. For, as the forefathers sang, quote, we can make liquor to sweeten our lips of pumpkins and parsnips and walnut tree chips. End quote. Finally, as for salt, that grossest of groceries, to obtain this might be a fit occasion for a visit to the seashore, or, if I did without it altogether, I should probably drink the less water. I do not learn that the Indians ever troubled themselves to go after it. Thus I could avoid all trade and barter, so far as my food was concerned, and having a shelter already, it would only remain to get clothing and fuel. The pantaloons which I now wear were woven in a farmer's family. Thank heaven there is so much virtue still in man, for I think the fall from the farmer to the operative as great and memorable as that from the man to the farmer. And in a new country, fuel is an encumbrance. As for a habitat, if I were not permitted still to squat, I might purchase one acre at the same price for which the land I cultivated was sold, namely eight dollars and eight cents. But as it was, I considered that I enhanced the value of the land by squatting on it. There is a certain class of unbelievers who sometimes ask me such questions as, if I think that I can live on vegetable food alone, and to strike at the root of the matter at once, for the root is faith, I am accustomed to answer such, that I can live on board nails. If they cannot understand that, they cannot understand much that I have to say. For my part, I am glad to bear of experiments of this kind being tried, as that a young man tried for a fortnight to live on hard, raw corn on the ear using his teeth for all mortar. The squirrel tribe tried the same and succeeded. The human race is interested in these experiments, though a few old women who are incapacitated for them, or who own their thirds in mills, may be alarmed. My furniture, part of which I made myself, and the rest, cost me nothing of which I have not rendered an account, consisted of a bed, a table, a desk, three chairs, a looking-glass three inches in diameter, a pair of tongs and andirons, a kettle, a skillet, and a frying-pan, a dipper, a wash-bowl, two knives and forks, three plates, one cup, one spoon, a jug for oil, a jug for molasses, and a japanned lamp. None is so poor that he need sit on a pumpkin. That is shiftlessness. There is a plenty of such chairs as I like best in the village garrets to be had for taking them away. Furniture. Thank God I can sit and I can stand without the aid of a furniture warehouse. What man but a philosopher would not be ashamed to see his furniture packed in a cart and going up country exposed to the light of heaven in the eyes of men, a beggarly account of empty boxes? That is Spaulding's furniture. I could never tell from inspecting such a load whether it belonged to a so-called rich man or a poor one. The owner always seemed poverty-stricken. Indeed, the more you have of such things, the poorer you are. Each load looks as if it contained the contents of a dozen shanties, and if one shanty is poor, this is a dozen times as poor. Pray, for what do we move ever but to get rid of our furniture, our exuviae, at last to go from this world to another newly furnished, and leave this to be burned? It is the same as if all these traps were buckled to a man's belt, and he could not move over the rough country where our lines are cast without dragging them, dragging his trap. 
He was a lucky fox that left his tail in the trap. The muskrat will gnaw his third leg off to be free. No wonder man has lost his elasticity. How often he is at a dead set. Quote, Sir, if I may be so bold, what do you mean by a dead set? End quote. If you are a seer, whenever you meet a man, you will see all that he owns, aye, and much that he pretends to disown, behind him, even to his kitchen furniture, and all the trumpery which he saves and will not burn, and he will appear to be harnessed to it, and making what headway he can. I think that the man is at a dead set who has got through a knot-hole or gateway where his sledge-load of furniture cannot follow him. I cannot but feel compassion when I hear some trim, compact-looking man, seemingly free, all girded and ready, speak of his furniture, as whether it is insured or not. But what shall I do with my furniture? My gay butterfly is entangled in a spider's web, then, even those who seem for a long while not to have any, if you inquire more narrowly, you will find have some stored in somebody's barn. I look upon England today as an old gentleman who is traveling with a great deal of baggage, trumpery which has accumulated from long housekeeping, which he has not the courage to burn, great trunk, little trunk, band box, and bundle throw away the first three at least. It would surpass the powers of a well man nowadays to take up his bed and walk, and I should certainly advise a sick one to lay down his bed and run. When I have met an immigrant tottering under a bundle which contained his all, looking like an enormous wen which had grown out of the nape of his neck, I have pitied him, not because that was his all, but because he had all that to carry. If I have got to drag my trap, I will take care that it be a light one and do not nip me in a vital part. But perchance it would be wisest never to put one's paw into it. I would observe, by the way, that it costs me nothing for curtains, for I have no gazers to shut out but the sun and moon, and I am willing that they should look in. The moon will not sour milk, nor taint meat of mine, nor will the sun injure my furniture or fade my carpet, and if he is sometimes too warm a friend, I find it still better economy to retreat behind some curtain which nature has provided than to add a single item to the details of my housekeeping. A lady once offered me a mat but as I had no room to spare within the house, nor time to spare within or without to shake it, I declined it, preferring to wipe my feet on the sod before my door. It is best to avoid the beginnings of evil. Not long since I was present at the auction of a deacon's effects, for his life had not been ineffectual. Quote, the evil that men do lives after them. End quote. As usual, a great proportion was trumpery which had begun to accumulate in his father's day. Among the rest was a dried tapeworm. And now, after lying half a century in his garret and other dust holes, these things were not burned, instead of a bonfire or purifying destruction of them, there was an auction, or increasing of them. The neighbors eagerly collected to view them, bought them all, and carefully transported them to their garrets and dust holes to lie there till their estates are settled, when they will start again. When a man dies, he kicks the dust. The customs of some savage nations might perchance be profitably imitated by us, for they at least go through the semblance of casting their slough annually. They have the idea of the thing, whether they have the reality or not. Would it not be well if we were to celebrate such a busk or feast of first fruits 
as Bartram describes to have been the custom of the muck-class Indians? Quote, when a town celebrates the busk, end quote, says he, quote, having previously provided themselves with new cloths, new pots, pans, and other household utensils and furniture, they collect all their worn-out clothes and other despicable things, sweep and cleanse their houses, squares, and the whole town of their filth, which with all the remaining grain and other old provisions they cast together into one common heap and consume it with fire. After having taken medicine and fasted for three days, all the fire in the town is extinguished. During this fast they abstain from the gratification of every appetite and passion whatever. A general amnesty is proclaimed, all malefactors may return to their town. On the fourth morning the high priest, by rubbing dry wood together, produces new fire in the public square, from whence every habitation in the town is supplied with the new and pure flame. They then feast on the new corn and fruits, and dance and sing for three days. And the four following days they receive visits and rejoice with their friends from neighboring towns who have in like manner purified and prepared themselves. End quote. The Mexicans also practiced a similar purification at the end of every fifty-two years, in the belief that it was time for the world to come to an end. I have scarcely heard of a truer sacrament, that is, as the dictionary defines it, quote, outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, end quote, than this, and I have no doubt that they were originally inspired directly from heaven to do thus, though they have no biblical record of the revelation. For more than five years I maintained myself thus solely by the labor of my hands, and I found that, by working about six weeks in a year, I could meet all the expenses of living. The whole of my winters, as well as most of my summers, I had free and clear for study. I have thoroughly tried school-keeping, and found that my expenses were in proportion, or rather out of proportion, to my income, for I was obliged to dress and train, not to say think and believe accordingly, and I lost my time into the bargain. As I did not teach for the good of my fellow men, but simply for a livelihood, this was a failure. I have tried trade, but I found that it would take ten years to get under way in that, and that then I should probably be on my way to the devil. I was actually afraid that I might, by that time, be doing what is called a good business. When formerly I was looking about to see what I could do for a living, some sad experience in conforming to the wishes of friends, being fresh in my mind to tax my ingenuity, I thought often and seriously of picking huckleberries. That surely I could do, and its small profits might suffice, for my greatest skill has been to want but little. So little capital it required, so little distraction from my wanted moods, I foolishly thought. While my acquaintances went unhesitatingly into trade or the professions, I contemplated this occupation as most uh, like theirs, ranging the hills all summer to pick the berries which came in my way, and thereafter carelessly dispose of them, uh, so to keep the flocks of Admetus. I also dreamed that I might gather the wild herbs or carry evergreens to such villagers as love to be reminded of the woods, even to the city, by hay-cart loads. But I have since learned that trade curses everything it handles, and though you trade in messages from heaven, the whole curse of trade attaches to the business. As I preferred some things to others, and especially valued my freedom, as I could fare hard and yet succeed well, I did not wish to spend my time in earning rich carpets or other fine furniture or delicate cookery or a house in the Grecian or the Gothic style just yet. If there are any to whom it is no interruption to acquire these things and who know how to use them when acquired, I relinquish to them the pursuit. Some are industrious 
and appear to love labor for its own sake, or perhaps because it keeps them out of worse mischief, to such I have at present nothing to say. Those who would not know what to do with more leisure than they now enjoy, I might advise to work twice as hard as they do, work till they pay for themselves and get their free papers. For myself I found that the occupation of a day laborer was the most independent of any, especially as it required only thirty or forty days in a year to support one. The laborer's day ends with the going down of the sun, and he is then free to devote himself to his chosen pursuit, independent of his labor. But his employer, who speculates from month to month, has no respite from one end of the year to the other. In short, I am convinced, both by faith and experience, that to maintain one's self on this earth is not a hardship, but a pastime. If we will live simply and wisely, as the pursuits of the simpler nations are still the sports of the more artificial, it is not necessary that a man should earn his living by the sweat of his brow, unless he sweats easier than I do. End of LibriVox Part 4 of Economy